Howdy, everybody. I'm going to tell you the story of me calling the cops on my drummer, my own drummer. One of the lowest points of my career. It felt like definitely one of the most embarrassing parts of my career. And I'm joined today with my drummer, Caleb Kelly, who was the source. Uh, we'll call it, call it co-source of this predicament. Welcome to the Granger Smith Podcast, episode 46. So much fun. Caleb's one of my best friends. So many good stories with him and probably more to come as more of these podcasts roll through with him. Comment below as the, as you hear this these stories if you want to hear more of Caleb. The best way to get a hold of me right now, if you want to talk to me right now, now you go to Cameo, get the app on your phone, Cameo or Cameo.com. You could find me on there and I could send you a video message. I could send you congratulations. I could send you a happy birthday. I can send you some uplifting messages or some, uh, um, maybe you want me to punk you out. Whatever you want me to say, uh, Cameo is a great way for me to talk to you. I could also direct message you. This is actually one of the, one of the, social media platforms, I would say the only one that I actually check the direct messages on and reply. Just me. I give you my word. It is just me that replies. No one else has access to my account but me. So I'm the only one that can reply. I'm the only one that's going to um, send you a message. So it's a great gift idea, maybe a great um, thing you want to send your girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse uh, congratulations or happy anniversary or, or um, probably the most common is, is happy birthday. Um, but I love Cameo. It's, it's, a, it's a really cool platform for me to use to talk to you or for you to hire me to send to someone else. It's super, super easy. You could do it as many times as you want. Something I'm, I have to talk about is this new album coming out next month. On August the 28th, that is, if you're watching this podcast real time, that is this Friday. Yes, this Friday, you're going to get two brand new songs from me, songs you've never heard before that are leading into the album that comes out in September. So you'll get two songs. You'll get to get a, a preview of the, a taste of the album. And on that day, we're also going to announce the exact date of release in September, the exact method of release, which, um, I know I've told you guys before, but there's more after September, so you'll hear more about that. And you'll also get the title of the album and the cover, so a lot to be revealed this coming Friday. Please pay attention to my, my socials. We'll be putting it all over my socials on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and YouTube. So um, hang out with us there. To, to hear these songs. You know, technically, whenever any an artist says, Our, my music's coming out Friday, technically, as you know, that means Thursday night at midnight Eastern United States time. So um, that is, I'm in Central, so that's typically 11 p.m. is when the new music comes out. So 11 p.m. Central on Thursday night, ugh, new music. So excited. Cannot wait for you guys to hear it. Can't wait for you even to, just to see the title. The other thing I go going on is the Earl Dibbles truck, restoring Earl Dibbles old truck is coming together. So I know a lot of these guys, a lot of you guys, you see the podcast and you want to comment below, when's the truck going to be restored? Soon, guys, soon. I just left the, the garage. That's why I'm wearing the Yee Yee Garage shirt right now if you're watching this on YouTube. And these are actually available again. We sold out in the, in the store, but we're back available at yeeyeeapparel.com. But I just left the garage, the Yee Yee garage, and uh, Butch and Bull are in there. We're coming close to getting the cab back. So this whole process is really going to be coming together in September. And that finale of that show is going to also have a song that is on the new album. Did that make sense? And it's, it's not the Yee Yee Nation song on this podcast. This is an older version, but the newer version of this Yee Yee Nation song that we've been playing at the intro to our shows and that we've been playing throughout the Earl Trucker restoration is now a full, complete song that's on the new album. Excited about that. Excited about the Yee Yee Apparel fall launch on September 18th. So there's a lot of stuff to be talking about. Um, at the time that I'm filming this podcast, 
I would, for, if you're watching it real time, I recorded this last week for you, and I'm so excited because tomorrow we're heading back on tour. We're going to Kansas and Nebraska and Wyoming, and excited that there are still places that want to hear live music that can do it in the right way. And I don't think we're going to be going backwards from here. So um, be looking for us to slowly start touring. I'm sorry if you're in some of those cities that it's just not going to happen in. I'm sorry about that. But things will slowly start opening and we'll be able to come to your town again. Um, man, I'm out of breath because there's so many things to be talking about right now. But I really want you to hear these stories with Caleb. Um, if you're someone that is struggling with any kind of loss or are or, or trying to find your identity or maybe you're struggling with some form of depression um, you're going to want to hear this story because this is a deep dark cave of the of the Granger music career and um, I've had a few of these caves in my career uh, this was one of them it just so happens it kind of revolved around my drummer and the, the only reason I even put it that way the reason I even bring forth like it's this is on Caleb is because we're so close and he knows my heart and he knows um, he knows me very very well we're, we're best friends so um, he understands that we have taken a journey together at one at one point um, one brother might be fallen and the other brother lifts him up and then we switch and then another brother's fallen and the other brother lifts him up and they, we keep me and Caleb swap places and we have for the last decade. So, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know somebody like that in your life. <sighs> Let me tell you the story about how I called the cops on my own drummer. Welcome to the Granger Smith podcast. Yee yee. <laughs> part of uh, probably several of the worst nights I've ever had on tour. Mm -hmm. You feel proud to have that status? Uh, it's nice to be remembered, uh, <laughs> but no. So you are the, um, you were the only band member, hopefully forever, that I had to call the cops on. Mm -hmm. But not just uh, like a disorderly, like we had to call the cops, I had to call the cops to really intervene in my business and I want to get to that I want to lead up to that moment and I want to preface all this by saying that you are today one of my best friends and you always have been for a long time like we never none, none of the stuff that's ever happened between us ended that yeah. you might have, actually you might have thought it did a couple times well yeah yeah, when you called the cops, I kind of thought... Kind of thought, this is it. So, well, I, Yeah, I just kept causing problems, so... But I got you on this podcast because several reasons. One, me and you have great stories together, and I could sit here by myself and tell these stories, but it helps that you're, you, you could remember things that I've forgotten. But you joined my band in, in 2011. Mm-hmm. March of 2011. That was that was uh, several months before my first baby was born. Yep. And you came in at a time when we were not a very very popular band. Earl Dibbles Jr. did not exist. In fact, that's true. Earl would come to be born in July of that year, that same year. So 
you came on, it's very interesting, you came on before Dibbles, which is in a lot of ways before anyone in the rest of the country besides a small select group in the state of Texas knew who we were musically as a band, me as a musician, period. So um, I think it's worth telling some of these stories to some people that didn't know us before then because it was a wild time. We were in a van, trailer, and not only were we not a very popular band, but we were trying very hard to be at that time, and we were acting like we were. And so we were traveling far distances. Mm-hmm. We did it. Um, your very first run was a yeah. West Coast run. <clears throat> our very, oh. f- I believe our first stop was Albuquerque. Yeah, our first stop was Albuquerque, and then it was like, Albuquerque. Uh, we ended in Amarillo, I think, because right after that was Winter Doug. Was what? On the way back was Winter Doug. Okay. <laughs> so we got to tell that story too. Uh, so um, you came on with us, really. You you auditioned for me, and then how long did we take off after that? We I had like seventy two hours to learn the twenty six songs. Okay. Before we left for a four day run. And it's not like you're playing guitar or bass, God bless those kind of people, but the drummer in my band has to play all the drum parts, which is difficult in itself, and then also run our click track mm-hmm. on, on a computer, laptop computer, which you were not that familiar with. So you were Mm-mm. multitasking. The same thing Dusty does today, it's the same system Dusty plays drums for me today, um, you were doing in 2011 in 72 yep. hours time, and it was it was different. It was before uh, it was before everybody had click track. So we were Mike when you guys brought me on. You said Mike was tapping on the mic to give everybody click. Yeah, and uh, so it was start stop me start stop get everybody on the click and then uh, lead them into the song and then lead them into the next one. Select you know whatever on on the laptop. So yeah. Actually, one of the proudest things I have is, is trying to push to get everybody on click track because that made my job easier. Yeah. Um, so that everybody could see the going into the next song was a lot easier if everybody had click track because <laughs> some people don't get along with it. Before we get too deep in stories, I feel like I also have to say that a lot of people probably know you from those days playing drums and maybe, maybe even more people know you in Yee Yee Nation because you're the warehouse manager of Yee Yee Apparel. Mm-hmm. And so you're in a lot of random Smith videos. You're in a lot of like truck restoration, Earl's truck restoration videos. You're actually out there working on it today with me. Oh, was the camera on? You, uh, you might have got like a hand of you oh. in there, like a shirt. So you've been with me for nine years in different capacities, mm-hmm. um, pretty much, pretty much nonstop, minus a few months here and there. But uh, but you. You're an amazing warehouse manager. Um, we could, we can get into why you're not the drummer anymore. Yeah. But there, it's all great stories worth telling. Um, I think I want to start by this, and I asked you just before we turned this camera on if we should go here or not, and you had a great answer to that. But looking back at uh, 2011 version of myself, not... Not a lot of loss in my life. Not a lot. Not a lot of understanding about grief. I was at that point. I was uh, three years away from my first big um, battle with grief when I lost my dad. And when you came on, you auditioned for me, and I asked you about your tattoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Said, so, ah, you know, it's like a casual <clears throat> conversation. Hey, what's uh, what's uh, that tattoo mean? And he said, oh, I lost my brother. I was like, oh, man, that's that's tough. I have two brothers myself. And then on your other arm, you lost another brother. Mm-hmm. And that's that's rough. And I didn't. I, it's hard to say, and you know what I'm trying to say, but like I didn't comprehend the loss of two brothers fully i just comprehended it as if any one else would think yeah man that's that's got to be really bad and the kicker to the whole thing was 
you lost Levi to a battle with cancer two months before that conversation. Yeah, two months before, two months before the audition, and then six months before that lost Noah. So it was lose Noah, who is we go by numbers. I'm two of five boys, so we lost three of five, and then six months later we lost four of five. Uh, and then two months later, that conversation between the two of us about that. And during the times that I've had, rough times that I've had, I've often thought of you in that numerical sense of 60 days after a major loss, this is when Caleb was auditioning for me. And you did that well, partly out of necessity, Got to got to work. You're a drummer. You got to work. And we were about to get evicted from the apartment. Actually, you literally had to so, work because you're going to get evicted. Yeah. So it didn't matter what the music was like or or how you guys were. I was going to take it um, for work. It just so happened that you guys were absolutely amazing, and you turned into one of my best friends. So, <laughs> so that was a plus. So I I me neither me or the rest of the band and crew really grasped the fact that we were taking out a drummer that two months before had lost his second brother within a year. Yeah. And not that maybe I would have done anything differently. I don't know if I could have. Um, but you were coming on more or less with baggage. And you're going to leave your wife and two children at home mm -hmm. to go on the road and expect to get a paycheck and expect to be, um, quote unquote, normal dude on the road. In an abnormal vocation. Yes. Yeah. And in a van where there's no escape, there's more escape in a bus. In a van, you're just right up on top in the benches, taking turns driving. Um, and this, th this recipe led to, um, a bunch of crazy stories on the road. It led to eventually me calling the cops on you. Mm -hmm. It also led ultimately to an understanding of grief and loss and coping with it that I would have to return to and try to take notes from. And um, <laughs> so tell me that that first show in Albuquerque, were you thinking about the brothers? The, uh, yeah. Yeah, because I think they would have been, I think they would have been really, really happy for me. Um, they always wanted to see me do that. They, or they saw, they saw me play, but to do it and that be my job, they would have been super excited. And I think that that's something anybody who deals with losses, from the loss of that point, of that person on, you're 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 robbed of those shared memories, you know, to where you yep. can say this person would be happy, or call them up and say, "Hey, you know, look what happened. Guess what happened, you know." Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah, every single time we played, I was I was thinking about them, uh, especially in Flagstaff. Yeah. So yeah, they were always on. You want you want to go there? You want to go to Flagstaff? Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. I think the first time. And I'm sorry, I didn't really think this story was going to go this way, but it kind of really helps. If I don't tell this backstory, then you're just a crazy dude. Yeah. But um, the first time we all noticed that you were dealing with demons was, and, and a lot of it with you came from alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's hard for you because, as I've come to understand over nine years, you're a very... You, you have very two strong lines of descendants, Irish and Mexican, mm. both very proud cultures, both, both very family oriented, both very society um, relationship oriented, and both really involve alcohol as a part of communion That's right. with family and friends. That's right. So you sit down. You have a beer with your buddies, and you feel normal. Mm -hmm. So you knew that alcohol, and you're not an alcoholic, by the way. No, no, we just, 
It just uh, amplifies certain things that you're dealing with, yeah. in my opinion. So you, you knew that you didn't, you weren't an alcoholic. You're not, you're not chemically addicted to the substance. So a few beers with your buddies would make you feel normal again. Um, it would make you feel like you're on a path of, of being in perfect respect and remembrance of your brothers and doing what they would want you to be doing. Yeah. If you don't do that and you're like pulling, you're not going to touch alcohol, you're going to avoid all these situations, then you're living a, a life of, that's absent of normal in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's you probably already, what you're thinking, right? Yeah, and you don't feel normal already because you, it's not normal to lose two siblings in a little over six months. So you already feel a little nor- abnormal, and then removing something else from it, just it all feels, uh, it all feels weird. But when you can just sit there and be like, I'm just gonna have, you know, a couple drinks and just relax and be happy and enjoy life the way they would want me to. That was always the goal. Yeah. You know, it's just to to be normal, uh, yep. to enjoy something. So you, I, it, I remember Pflugerville, Texas, yes. Graham Central Station. I believe this is the first time, right? Yeah, that was probably the the big one. Yeah, for some reason I had the hospital on my mind that night. Okay. Yeah. So we had a few drinks after the show, very normal, very casual. And I'm just thinking for you, I'm speaking for you, you probably think, yeah, beer, two beers, maybe a mixed drink. We had a great show. Friends and family came. I feel normal. Mm. I'll have another. Let's let's amplify this feeling of normalcy. And I don't know. After that point, it wasn't a lot. You didn't have a lot. You like you weren't stumbling. No, no. It it it. Uh, I mean, it's all bubbling there by the surface. Yeah. It never really takes a lot for it to kick off. So someone comes I and feel. tells me, Caleb, <clears throat> you, you got to go get Caleb. He's outside in the trailer, and he's having a meltdown. It's like, okay, new guy, you know, what's this about? Go out there, and you were in, the, in our trailer, an empty trailer, punching with your bare fist a three-quarter inch plywood wall. Yeah. And I, and and I see I see two things, and this is ha- this is going to happen in every other story. I see two things. One, I see my buddy having a meltdown. Two, I see my drummer breaking his hands on a three-quarter inch plywood wall. Yeah, I don't know what. Uh, yeah, it was just just rage and and loss, and uh, it always crept up. I'm sure to you guys it, it was like. I thought everything was going good. Yeah. I thought right. everything was fine. You know, I thought we were having a great night. It was always like that. It was always the story. We're having such a great night. And then and then something happened. But, you know, from what comes out of left field to someone it is never. It's just right there constantly. So, unfortunately, you know, like, like you said, it was a kind of a constant theme that it seemed to come out of left field. So tell me what you told me before we started the camera about why you even wanted me to, to bring up the brothers? Um, well, first, I love them, and I love talking about them. Uh, but I, I think I think it gets, gives me a chance to talk about why, you know, why that kind of happened. I, I believe there are reasons and there are excuses you know, there can have re- you can have reasons that you do something, but that doesn't excuse why you did it or doesn't give you a pass. Um, so I had reasons, but not excuses. Excuses kind of give you a, a pass for what you did. I had reasons, and the reasons were the loss of the brothers. And then, you know, like what we were talking about was uh, that was my first impression to a lot of different people. And it wasn't my first impression to you guys, but it was not too far down the line. Yeah that you guys saw this crazy individual um, having a meltdown, breaking down, breaking stuff, you know, breaking knuckles and things like that. And it, that's my legacy to, unfortunately, a lot of different people. And uh, I know there's other musicians out there who are, if you're not struggling with the, the substance, you may be struggling with 
something inside and the substance is is the catalyst it's the straw that breaks you know the camel's back and it's just the fuel to that fire and uh it's unfortunate that a lot of musicians i think a lot of artistic people have that because you feel so deeply you know you go through highs you can be the happiest person someone's ever seen and then obviously you can be you know the saddest person that someone's seen and i gotta say to that that you are it might not come across on this podcast because of the subject matter but you are one of the top three if not the funniest guy i know in my life you're witty you say the funniest jokes you're just a hilarious dude always have been still are today and you were back then and so that was like what you said where we just thought i thought this guy had all his ducks in a row he was he's so funny he was just laughing two hours ago with us telling jokes that that actually that was part of what would set me off as oddly as that sounds um being funny someone telling me that i'm funny because noah was the funniest person that i have ever met that yeah. a lot of people have ever met yeah. and uh, so making people laugh would remind me of him and then people telling me that I'm funny or someone telling me that you're the funniest person I've ever known w was a compliment coming from somebody. Yeah. But to me, it redirected, you know. It's exactly right. So it well, it would seem like a compliment. Maybe it's we were exactly having a right great because time. we had many moments during dark. We had dark moments where I would be like, Caleb, you got so much going for you. You got your family at home. You're one of the funniest guys I've ever met. And then, boom, you'd yeah. say, I'm not the funniest guy. Yeah. You should have met my brother Noah. He was funny. I'm nothing. And and I'd be like, oh, gosh, bad yeah. bad thing to say. And same thing with the, the nicest. You can be such a nice guy. And then, you know, I'd be like, Levi was the most compassionate person. And it, yeah, it was uh, what would be a compliment coming from you guys. I didn't take it that way, obviously, because that wasn't what was on my mind. I mean, everything said uh, Flagstaff was in the mountains. Yeah. So. You're, for, you're a Colorado boy. Yes. Colorado Springs. Home of the mountains. Home of the mountains. In uh, Colorado, you are, you are very, um, you have a lot of pride for Colorado. Mm -hmm. Mountain man. So shout out to all the Colorado people listening. Um, you you uh, moved to Texas for several reasons. Music mm -hmm. was a big part of that. And um, your parents, your folks are still in Colorado. And mm -hmm. one brother. Two brothers. Actually, the Amos is back now. Amos is back now. Okay. I've been back there for a while. So yeah, two of the remaining two are in Colorado. So uh, a big part of of what we're doing with this podcast, telling stories, two buddies telling stories on the road. But there's, and also, I'm going to tie in a little piece of this to anyone that's listening in two parts. One, someone that's listening that struggling in life with some kind of loss or depression or grief. And I'm showing this as the light at the end of the tunnel, the, the other side of the fence. And I'm also presenting this to friends and employers and buddies that have one of these kind of people in their lives that showing them that there is another side of the coin. There is a way out of this. Yeah. If you, if you apply the proper pressure where it needs to be, um, you could stop the bleeding and, you're you're my example in my world of a guy that was written off as lost yeah in a lot of ways and now you're one of our most valuable employees at Yee Yee Apparel and still one of my best friends and I'm grateful that um for all that I'm also grateful that we get to you get to relive 2011 2012 with me uh, a time when there was a big transition before we became a a band that people cared about and I like to hang on to those memories and you kind of keep me grounded when it comes to that kind of stuff. Lots changed. Yeah. And a lot has changed on the outside, but on the inside, we're still, it's still me and Tyler and Parker yeah. and you, you and, and you know, so there's a lot to, that's the core of it is still the same. Yeah. It's the, the nuts and bolts, the main ingredients. There's a lot of extra extra stuff on it, but the, I'm always impressed at the hard work and the innovation that comes from you, Smith boys. I mean, it's just no grass. I always say no grass grows underneath your feet. It's just <laughs> constantly moving. 
So, which is just amazing. That's why people are looking towards you guys, especially during this time, because it's not just music that you have. You know, you've got all these uh, finger in a lot of different pies. You know, you got it's uh, a lot of different things going, which is impressive. And no grass grows in Texas at all right now. That's true. It's too hot. It's, it's all it's all dead. It's you... 105 <laughs> degrees outside. Um, I'm gonna take a, qu- a quick break, and then you want to go to Flagstaff, Arizona, with me. Mm-hmm. When I called the cops on you? Yes. All right. Be right back. So we, we're rolling in the van. We got a, a little run. We're going to Arizona. We're going to Colorado. It's like a Utah stop in there. I don't in Mexico, maybe. Or maybe it started with, I don't know. Well, the day after, well, right after Flagstaff, we went to the Grand Canyon. Okay. So we have a little western run with the band and this was in 2011 i think so yeah we go to flagstaff arizona to play the museum club small um music venue a really fun place uh and the day starts we arrive the day starts with uh, me you and maybe tyler Johnny and Tyler, because we were training for the boot walk. Johnny and Tyler were training for the 100-mile boot walk that we were doing. Was that the first year of it, maybe? That was the second year, because you guys did the first year right before it, and then, and then I was happy to join okay. the second year. So we were in this, in this little routine of getting to a venue, and during our off time, we would put on combat boots and walk to try to get our legs acclimated to walking long distances. And breaking boots. And breaking in boots. And we start walking in Flagstaff. We start at the venue and we just start walking. And our only reference was the mountain that was there. It was like a big mountain there. Mm-hmm. And we're like, let's walk to the foot of the mountain. Thinking like maybe there's a stream there, really cool. Path, we could Path, and then maybe we can get up into the mountain a little bit. Maybe there's some kind of trail. So we start. We didn't know this, but we, we go right into a Navajo reservation. No signs. No signs. We just walked straight into it. And what we also didn't know was it's not good to walk into a Navajo reservation. <laughs> yeah, it's not very, it's not very, I mean, well, I mean, I imagine it's probably nicer if you're invited, but we mm. just started walking. And that's when we saw that older gentleman on the backside of that store. Yeah. And he was like, no, we thought he was, I don't know what we thought he was on or something like that, but. It looked like he was trying to get our attention. At the, like a grocery store. Mm-hmm. So like behind the grocery store, there was this man. And evidently that was the entrance to the reservation. Like that next street was going to start the reservation. We didn't know that. And there was this old man. We thought he was homeless and drunk. He was yelling at us to tell us to stop. Stop, stop. And we thought he was like going to say, stop, my car's broke down and I need some cash yeah. because I'm, you know, whatever. So we ignored him as we would just a, a bum asking for a dollar we just just keep just keep your faith straight forward just keep walking so then we entered the reservation unknowingly and things started happening around us Our faces were turning towards us everyone was eyeing us um so then the two dudes yeah they started following us and uh we're yelling at us Yes. And we were like, all right. In their language. Uh, yeah, obviously we're, we're not where we're supposed to be. Uh, but you know, it was an accident. We, you know, we wouldn't have done that. But, yeah, it definitely started to get a little intense, you know, just kind of yelling and stuff like that. And as we're walking, I remember walking back through, like, that little, I wouldn't call it, like, a common area, but it was, like, a, it was like a playground there and sidewalks. And they were, like, really yelling. And they were, like, come in you know kind of getting closer they got they got together and started following us again and yeah that was a they were going to jump us and we didn't know that we didn't know where we were and if we did know where we were i don't think i would have known it was a bad deal for four white dudes to just go trespassing through a navajo reservation uninvited because that probably looked like we were looking for trouble yeah or like we didn't care yeah we didn't we didn't respect yeah, like, land. oh, we'll go where we want. No, we wouldn't have gone there. We would have totally respected it. We just had no idea where yeah. where we were. So that, we never made it to the foot of the mountain. Uh-uh. 
Instead, as soon as we figured out we were in the wrong, we made our way out of there. Um, luckily, there was not a confrontation. We made our way out and started heading back to the venue, but we were kind of amped up about that. Like we went back to the crew and said, "Hey guys, don't don't walk towards the mountain. That's the reservation. You're, it's it's uh, you don't want to go that way." We had guys yelling at us. So it was a close call. I mean, we was we were scared. I had the adrenaline pumping. We had adrenaline pumping. So that kind of set the scene for what the night that was going to come for us. And we go, we play the show, and it was a great show. Yeah, I had a blast. We we had a really good time. Great crowd for a band like us that was relatively unknown to be all the way in Arizona and play a show with people that were really interested in in it. Um, it was a great it was a great night, and it was a worthy it was a worthy night of a celebration of some sort. Yeah. So we have a few drinks, mm -hmm. and. This was long after Flukerville, Texas, where me and you had had many conversations like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I yeah. can control this. Uh, but I need, to have, I need to be able to have a drink with my boys to feel normal. Cool. Can't yeah. argue with that. And we were in the mountains. So I was... We were in the mountains, which felt like Colorado. Yeah. So I should, I should have known right then to be like, maybe, maybe don't, you know, because uh, everything's close to the surface. You know, it's it's always closer than you think. The uh, that side, the dark side. The dark side. So, do you remember what uh, our keyboard player said to you to set you off that night after a few drinks? Uh, love him to death. I don't know if you'll say his name. I I, I love him. I don't him. think he we'll, listens to this podcast. All right. Well, uh, we'll call him Derek Herrera. <laughs> and uh, but the poor guy, it wasn't his fault at all. Uh, he was just trying to get us to load up. He's very, you know, he does he he did his job trying to get things on and off stage very good, and there was nobody following us, so I wasn't in a hurry. No other band playing after us. Yeah, so that was it, and we had time to take our stuff down. So I don't know what the hustle was, and I had already had a handful of drinks, and uh, so I'm kind of loading up, and uh, the the encounter we had, and being in the mountains, and uh, the time of year. And just the fact that it was all bubbling under the surface, you know, it kind of kept asking me and kept asking me, and then, uh, and then I, I just, I just remember dropping drum gear, and then, I don't really, ra I do remember uh, punching a suburban out outside mm -hmm. of of the venue with this hand, and doing quite a bit of damage to that hand. But you broke I, your hand. Yeah. Broke my hand. And we had three shows left to go. Yeah, I remember that because I remember calling my dad and telling him, and he's like, "You're gonna play those shows." And I was like, "I know." And he goes, "No, you're gonna play those shows. I don't care if you have to tape the drumstick to your hand. You're gonna play those shows." So, and I did. But yeah, that was a. I don't know what it was. I sh I should have known. That it was that, not that I could tell how far beneath the surface that was, but that the fact that I couldn't tell should have been you know a, a warning i think when you're walking through grief uh it's like imagine walking down the middle of a road you have days where you're walking down the middle of the road and on the left are is a good day or a good night and on the right is a bad night that's on a good day you're walking down the middle of a road and then on certain days you're walking down the middle of a sidewalk and on that night i was walking like the down the blade of a knife so that's how it could have gone either way and and it very quickly went uh bad jekyll and hyde as you yes, called it back then yes hyde he, uh, you became hyde mm -hmm. it was truly um as as lincoln watches the incredible hulk it was truly you turned into the green man mm -hmm. and you couldn't go back and the green man he doesn't like caleb no no, he yeah. wants to destroy everything that guy has. He's so like, I come outside and you were punching the back of a suburban, the glass, as if it's a um, padded couch. You're just gonna, slamming it with your hand and you're breaking the bones in your hand. Couldn't feel it. Didn't care. So I just, run out with Tyler. We 
we stop you from hitting the Suburban. And luckily, luckily, we didn't confront you because you were ready to fight anybody or anything. You would have fought your own family if they were there. Yeah. You wanted to fight anything. You would have fought God or your dad or any or, or the angel Gabriel. It wasn't didn't matter. You wanted to fight. So when Tyler came out there to break you up, to break it up, you turned on us like, okay, let's go. Hey, if you don't want me to punch the Suburban, I'll punch your face. <laughs> Basically, in, in a bunch of words and in, in hours of conversation, we, instead of antagonizing you and getting mad, luckily we recognized that you were not Caleb. It was the first of many times when I realized I'm not talking to my buddy Caleb right now. I actually called him. I gave him a name, Kaleeb. Yeah. I named Kaleeb. you Kaleeb. From then on out, it's it Kaleeb. literally not. So if you're listening to this podcast and you know of this kind of situation, maybe it's you, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a brother or sister, you could recognize that they, they turn into the Hulk. They turn into Hyde. They turn into Kaleeb. And they, it, you can't reason with that person. And you sure can't confront them or fight them because no. there is no winning that fight. It's, it's going to turn out to the, the end result of a true fight if we were to have fought. As you've mentioned it several times. Hey, I might not kill you. You might beat me. But in the end, you're going to be missing an yeah. ear uh, and half I, of your nose. Your eyes going to be gouged out. You're going to remember me. <laughs> you're going to remember me for the rest win, of but your you'll life never from your that deformity fight. that you have from this night. That's basically how you put it. Yeah. And luckily, Tyler and I realized that. We diffused the situation, and we talked you into going to bed. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, let's stop. We still have things to load in the trailer. But we're going to load it. The, ho- the hotel is attached to the same parking lot as the venue. So here's the hotel key, buddy. You just go in. I'm so sorry you're having a bad night. Just go in there and sleep it off, which didn't work. No, no, it didn't. I was going to go to a mountain. You go back to the hotel, and you basically decide that, yes, you recognize there's a problem. You recognize you're not yourself. And the only way to reconcile this problem is at the top of the mountain. Yes. So you're going to go to the top of the mountain. We remind you that there's a Navajo reservation in between you and the mountain, and then you quickly acknowledge, I'll take on the whole Navajo tribe. Yes, which is <laughs> not a good idea. And I, I wasn't in the right frame of mind uh, at all. I was, yeah, my goal was to go to the top of the mountain. I remember saying to you, to the top? Yes. I sure hope that no one listening actually thinks that we're talking bad about the navajo tribe it's not that no, at all they, yeah it's like you guys are just a, if you're listening you're just a um a really uh, unfortunate side effect to this whole story but yeah. it had nothing to do with specifically it could have been it could have been any um group of people that didn't want to be imposed upon <laughs> could have been St. Mary's Convent that was right next door. It could have been the nuns. Yeah. The circus just came in town, and unfortunately, it was right next door. In your mind, because I know you very well, so in your mind, you're thinking, I'm going to reconcile like Moses on the top of this mountain, and God's going to speak to me in a burning bush. But in order to get to that burning bush on top of this mountain, I'm going to have to go through the enemy. Uh And and knowing what happened earlier that day, it's got to be ten times worse in the middle of the night, and I will welcome that adversary. And if I die in a fight against the the entire Navajo tribe, then so be it. That's probably better than the current state of my life. That's about as much sense as it made in my mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you said, it could have been anybody. It wasn't. It was just any adversity, any fight, any pain, any bad situation, any fight. Uh, that was in front of me was more than welcome at that point. And, and you were not adamant about going alone. You you were welcoming us. The, the open invitation was there to, hey, you want to go with me? We're going to the top of the mountain. Yeah. It would actually be better if you fought the Navajo tribe with me instead of just being. And so. Which and was our, weird because <laughs> nobody said yes. <laughs> no one no one agreed to that. Not one taker. I didn't want to go. Uh, it was like probably two o'clock in the morning by this time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was yeah because we had done we had played and then everything was uh, either getting loaded up or loaded up. Um, 
Thanks to whoever loaded my drum kit. I think it was Frank. Yeah, maybe. The, so there, there's an X factor to the story thus far. You are and were back then an, an avid 2A supporter, mm -hmm. um, constant, constantly caring. And we knew that you had a pistol on you. Mm -hmm. You always had, I guess that was your SIG. You had your uh, SIG. Glock. You had your Glock on you. And we knew that you were going to go to the mountain, to the top, and, and go through the reservation, and you always had a Glock on you. This is not a good combination with you, alcohol, your hide, your Kalib. You have your pistol in your, in your pocket, and you're going to go through uh, a hostile group of people. So this is bad. A bad recipe. Yeah. Bad. And so when I realized sense. I couldn't stop you from going to the mountain, my next, my next line of thinking was, okay, I can't stop Caleb, but what I can do is ask to take his gun from him. So then if he goes, at least he's not going to kill anybody or get killed. Yeah. Yeah, or just, yeah. Just, That's my thinking at, by, was, by uh, 3 a.m. now probably. Yeah, it, it was a long time. Probably probably hours of uh, awkwardness. But, yeah, that was my plan was to kind of go to the top of this mountain and, and uh, just go there. So I was going to stay the night. So I realized because you played the show, you didn't play a show with gun on you. No. Because we were playing at a bar. So no. you had it in our trailer in the center section of our trailer that had a separate lock and key. Mm. So I, as, I, as I'm putting this together in my head, I realize – I'll take the key from the trailer and I'll go hide it. So that way I'll say, okay, buddy, you're free to go. I can't stop you from yeah. going to the mountain. I'm not going to go with you. I hope you're back by 7 a.m. when we leave to go to Colorado Springs, which is ironically My where hometown. we were going to your hometown the yeah. next day to see your dad. Well, almost. We were going to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, we went to the Grand and Canyon. And then to Colorado Springs. But the, we were having an off day in the Grand Canyon. So I take the key and hide it. And I say, you're free to go, right? I'm tired of arguing. It's been hours of going back and forth. So you go, just like I predicted, to the trailer to get your gun, mm -hmm. to go into the Navajo reservation with mm -hmm. your gun. You realize it's locked and there's no key. And I was totally cool with that. Or wait, no. <laughs> yeah. I was furious. That's right. You came back as if, as if your, uh, your Second Amendment has been violated by uh, Democratic government. Which it probably needed to be tempered a little bit it probably needed to just be like why don't you take a break from yeah from it for now that, yeah. that was uh that was a really that was a really good idea and a good call on y'all's part so i was hillary clinton to you yes at that moment yeah you, you really couldn't have done anything positive that i was gonna be on board with at that time you could have you could have given me a million dollars and I would have found some reason to be angry. So then the plan, no pun intended, backfired on me because as I'm just thinking, I'm going to forget it. I'm going to let him deal with this problem of, of being locked out from his own gun. I'm going to let him deal with this and I'm going to go to bed. That was wishful thinking. So I go to the hotel room with Tyler. This is back in a time when we had one or two, one room or two. We had two rooms. Two rooms uh, with everyone. Yeah, and it was two two guys to a bed. Okay. For the most part. In in our room it was. Yeah. So I go back to my room. I've got Tyler in there. I've got Eric or Derek, excuse me, you said. Yeah, Derek. Our keyboard player. And I go in there like I'm wishful thinking I'm going to go to sleep. And you come and find me. And you have made up your mind that... That gun and this trip to the mountaintop is worth bloodshed with your band brothers. And you have made up your hide, has made up his mind, Kaleeb, that I will fight you until you, until you submit to give me that key. Or tell me where it's hidden. Yeah, the hide's persistent, if nothing else. It just, I, I, you know, when you, you meet somebody, and I'm sure people who are watching this podcast know somebody who like there's no reasoning with a person like that and once they have something in their head whether it be i need to get this back or that person said something 
Yeah. Or that person's looking at me. None of it makes sense. Yeah. But you're you're trying to talk to a crazy mm-hmm. person at that point. We were thinking, should we zip tie him to the shower? Let him sleep it off? That was like an option. Zip tie to the option. Um, so I'm going to take a quick break, and I'll tell you how I finally called the cops. So this all came to a head when you you basically, it, during a conversation in the doorway of the hotel, I'm saying, sorry, buddy, I'm not going to give you the key to the trailer, to your gun. Mm-hmm. You're on your own, and you stuck your foot in the door. Yes. And said, here's the ultimatum. I did. Either you tell me where that key is so that you can give me my property back or we're all going to fight. And I realize that I'm taking on all of you and I'm okay with those odds. I'm okay with the consequences of the bodily harm that that might cause me, which is the same thing you thought about the Navajo tribe. Yeah, I wasn't really worried about... uh I wasn't worried about what happened to me, you know, because it was just needed to get uh, to something. And uh, I think it, maybe even a little bit of accomplish something. Yeah. You know, like a, get, a, get a victory. Yeah. You know, because it didn't feel like anything was, you know, it, w- it would have been not to achieve something where it just seems like everything's kind of going you know, I'm sure that was part of it. Yeah. Mainly it was because I had my mind set on it. And, and you can't tell someone, you know, who's that crazy right then, no. Or, you know, it's, it's just, you're dealing with a, a crazy person at that point. So. So I, I've pretty much left with one choice in my mind. Do you disagree with my one choice? No. No, no. I think I only had one option. No, yeah, that was that was that was all you all you could do. I said, "All right, man, I got one card to play, mm-hmm. one only. I got to do what is probably going to be the most embarrassing moment of my personal career. I am going to have to call the cops on my own drummer." Mm-hmm. Please, Caleb, don't make me do this. Don't make me live out a terribly embarrassing moment. In a sm- relatively small town where, where we call dispatch and they come to Museum Club, they're going to know who the band was that played there. They're going to know me. Yeah. Please like a, don't make me do this. It was a huge town with a lot going on. Yeah. Please don't make me call the cops. Please don't make me do this. But, you, but you're only leaving me one choice if you don't back down. You stood there with your foot in the door, stared me right in the eye, and said, I'm willing to accept that consequence. Yeah, wish I hadn't been so <clears throat> so uh, persistent. Yeah, and, that's uh, a that's saying that's understating it. You per, your persistence in, when you're Hyde or Kaleeb. Yeah, yeah, Hyde he and Kaleeb he he just yeah he doesn't give up. I'll give that to he him. He does not you give know? up. Although I wish he would, you know, like would have like found a really hard crossword puzzle or, <laughs> or a knitting pattern. Like, don't give up, Hyde. <laughs> keep on, do keep that. on work on that puzzle, buddy. You're going to get it. You, you'll finish that sweater, but no, it was always destructive <laughs> so, stuff. So as if I was living in some old Western movie, I decided to count to 10 or count uh-huh. down from 10. Yeah. <laughs> With my phone in my hand, mm-hmm. 911 dialed. I start. I begin a, a slow countdown from ten, as if that's going to change your mind. Yeah, it was a it was a bizarre, <laughs> a bizarre drunk crazy New Year's Eve countdown, just in a hotel doorway. So I start at ten. You don't budge. You're just staring me, just staring me down, just glassed over, just staring right through me. Nine, eight, seven. You're just not budging. Your foot's in the door. You have to get your gun. 911 dispatch. And it's like, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hello, um, man. Good evening. Yeah. It's about four o'clock in the morning. How are you? <laughs> um, I, I need an officer to come to the so and so hotel outside of the museum club. Um, one of my employees has had too much to drink. 
correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember. One of my employees has had too much to drink, um, and he is wanting to put himself in a dangerous situation with threatening us. Does he have we- does he have a weapon? <laughs> That's a problem. No, um, he has a knife. He's not using it, but he's wanting to get his handgun. Where's the handgun? It's locked away, and I have the key. He's trying to get it. So I basically explain the situation. Okay, officers are on the way. And they kept asking me, like, is he in possession? Where is the knife right now? <laughs> like, it's in his pocket. It's in his pocket. And he's not in possession of any other weapons, which is, you know, legitimate questions. They're putting officers at risk, sending them at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, they don't know what they're running into. So they arrive. The uh, it commences the most embarrassing, you know, sequence. So thus far, I've had more since then, more embarrassing moments, like getting naked on the table after breaking two ribs in the hospital in New Jersey. He did tell me that was weird. That was terrible. Um, you, Kaleeb, switches off as soon as the red, red and blue lights arrive. Kaleeb, as it turns out, is a big fan of law enforcement. <laughs> yes, he is. He's a He's a staunch supporter of law enforcement and the military. <laughs> and he typically calms down when he's talking to law enforcement. I don't, I don't so know. What, to, he's got a lot of bad qualities. To the bitter that end, all right. to the bitter end, Kaleeb is a law enforcement supporter. Yeah. Uh, true American patriot. <laughs> Thanked him, talked to him about that. Yeah, they were super cool. Too. They were really nice. Well, when they showed up, yeah, like you said, Kaleeb all of a sudden turns... And it's just talking to them. You met them in the parking lot. Yeah. And they're like, where's, where, you know, where's the guy we're dealing with? You're like, oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. the guy they called him. Yeah, they're like, all right, we're looking for oh, That's me. <laughs> and they're like, you? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, all right, let's, uh, and they're kind of looking me over. They were super cool. Uh, so one, one comes up to me. It's like typically what they do. Like if two cars came and one branches off and goes straight to me and he's like, where's the firearm? It's like it's in this trailer over here, and he walks over there. He checks the lock. Um, okay, he's like, "Keep it secure." And you, meanwhile, are talking to the other officer. Mm-hmm. You're telling him the story, and it basically comes. It actually solved the entire problem because you weren't um, you weren't intoxicated enough to be taken in, and you weren't causing a disturbance. Currently, you were just threatening to. Yeah, and they were, I, you know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get my gun and shoot anybody. I was going to get my gun, which was just in in a a drunk dude doing that and and wanting to go climb a mountain is just a bad idea. Yeah, I I believe that it's just a horrible idea. You're right. You because you don't know what would happen. Yeah. So, so just the fact that I wanted to do that was a bad idea. But you fundamentally, it all boiled down to you have a Second Amendment right to carry. And no one was going to take that right away from you. That's pretty much what the entire thing boiled down to. It wasn't yeah. about I'm going to go hurt somebody or I'm going to kill myself or anyone else or shoot anything. or eat. You just wanted to have it on you because I wasn't letting you. Yeah, And that, that was, was a problem to you. Yeah, that was it. Like I said, you know, you get a really, really intoxicated person with one uh, tunnel vision goal in their mind. Uh, and it just it, that had to happen for some reason. Or that was my goal. At least. So they basically told you and me, go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And you listened to them. Yes. Kind well, of. Kind sort of. of. Sort of. You listened to them in terms of leave the gun alone. Uh-huh. So then you went to bed, and we went to bed, and then you got back up. Yes. <laughs> and went to the mountain. Yes, I did. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get all the way up to the mountain. So I went towards the mountain. I stopped in the middle of that big, like common area or uh that area right there in the beginning of like the little village area and just screamed and invited uh whatever was gonna happen i don't know a fight or or whatever so but by that time what was it like three o'clock in the morning some random dude screaming in the middle of that little park area i wouldn't have gone out there either this is a little bizarre and then I, i i i fell asleep up against a tree in that little park area right there uh, only for, I don't know, it could have been just a handful of minutes. And then went back. You made it back by roll time. I went back to the hotel room. I slept, like, in the 
closet, I believe. And then we got up and uh, rolled. We got up and went to the Grand Canyon the next day. You, that's when you realized you had a broken hand, by the way. Yes. You came to. I was on time for roll, by the way. Yeah. To all you guys who deal with time. Yeah. At least I made it to that. You are on time for roll. Uh, you realized when you became sober you had a broken hand. Yeah. And we went, of all places, to the Grand Canyon. It was all of our first time to go. Is it your first time? Mm-hmm. So yeah, all never... of us, it was our first time to go. And it was incredible but side note if you haven't been to the grand canyon and you're wanting to travel internationally save that first and go to the grand canyon because it's incredible it's like a, a worldwide spectacle you can't explain it pictures don't do it justice you have to see that that chasm that the depth of that you have to see it with your own eyes which is very ironic to go to a place like that and experience the wonder of the earth of the planet and the depth of the planet and the the space while you're dealing with what then become small problems yeah. b- amongst a couple friends. Yeah, it... Uh, and we wrote, we walked through that canyon and didn't say a word. No, and it started off walking together-ish and then very quickly I was alone, uh, but I wouldn't have hung out with me either. <laughs> I would, so I'm walking up and down the Grand Canyon, out of breath because I'm hungover, uh, and and just just tired and nauseous, and my hands broken. So I stopped. There was snow there at that time. I stopped and I'd stick my hand in the snow, and just sit there. And people were like walking by. They're probably like, "What in the world is this guy doing?" Reeks of alcohol still. He's just sitting on this rock with his hand in the snow and uh yeah i went down as far as i I, as far as i could and then uh and then walked back up there it was such it was a bizarre i don't count that as my my grand canyon trip i always tell i always tell heidi we should go see the grand canyon and uh, you know that'd be that'd be cool to go see that together and i don't count that trip as a grand canyon trip for me because hyde went I didn't really go, yeah. and my hand was broken, so it wasn't like a really good experience. Yeah, I, I remember we were just walking, and we were alone. We weren't with you because we separated just naturally, but we weren't really talking either. No. Not, like, me and the other guys weren't talking either because everyone was, A, we didn't get much sleep, and... B, we were tired from walking and cold. It was really, really cold that day in yeah. the Grand Canyon. Yes, yeah, like in the in the teens, I believe, or lower. And and we just all had a lot on our mind. You know, it was a lot to take in. It was a lot to to think. Well, how do we move forward as a band? Like, are we ever going to be the same in a gig again? Like, is Caleb gone? Is he quitting? Should we fire him? Is he gonna? Is this is this even smart at in any level to continue on? So there's a lot of stuff kind of rolling around in our brains, and as if as in so many other times in music with me, what ultimately healed that was the first show back. Yeah, because then you reunite in making music together as a group. And each person does his part collectively for the song. And without your part, there is no song. Without any of the five parts, there's no song. So we come together collectively and and contribute our piece to the music. And that naturally heals the damage that was done that night in Flagstaff. Yeah, you get to to work back together and especially creatively, artistically, you're... You're doing something, creating with another person. And uh, that was always kind of therapeutic, at least for me. You guys had to play with me. So, you know what I mean? Like, at least for those shows, it was like we had to at least get along on stage. So, um, But you guys were always so more than gracious enough, more than more than I probably would have been. And it was it was nice to to get back to that any 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 kind of normalcy 
so playing on stage was good even if my hand was broke and I could barely hold that drumstick so kind of did a tape job to hold it on there uh, it was nice to be back with you guys you know like I said you guys were never really you guys never like shunned me or anything like that which was which was really cool it was just how could you guys at that time how could any of you guys understand you know at that time yeah what what was causing me to be so uh so crazy what would your what your dad say because we went to the next day after grand canyon we went to colorado spring to play that show what did your dad say when he saw you uh he asked about my hand yeah, he was like, uh, I called him right after, right after it happened, or the next day, and told him, and that's when he was like, you're, you're going to play those shows, and uh, I was going to play them anyways, but he definitely made sure that I knew that I was going to play the shows, and then when I saw him, you know, he asked about my hand, and, uh, you know, he's, he, he always, he calls me Cabe, so, and, uh, you know that, you call me Cabe. And he's like, okay, I just, what are you doing? You know, and this isn't the way, and and uh, you got to stop doing stuff like this. And so, yeah, it was really, it was really unfortunate because they they got to see Hyde too on a couple different occasions, which hurts because it's it's your family, and not only, they understand, yeah. you know, they knew understood the yeah. the loss of of Levi and Noah, so. It doesn't make any sense. You're you're terrible to whoever you're around when you're when you're like that. Unfortunately, and that's one of the main things that I want to tell people uh, who are going through grief or 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 whatever you're going through in your life where you're not yourself is that you might not be able to make it better immediately right now. But one of the best things you can do for yourself is to not make it worse. Yeah. Like I made yeah. it worse. I didn't have to make it worse. My life could have kept going in a, in a direction and slowly climbing up the hill. But so many times I'd get up a little bit and then I would make it worse. Jordan Peterson says that no matter how dark of a hole, no matter the depths of hell that you have created for yourself, no matter where that is, it always could get deeper. And humans have a great way of finding a way to get deeper in the hole they've already made. Yeah, it it it's a hundred percent correct. In that, if you would just wait, it's hard to do that at the time, obviously. But if you would just wait, things would get better. Or like when I t tell people about grief, I go, "It doesn't get better; it gets different." And sometimes, different is the answer to prayer to what you're dealing with at that time. Just wait. Don't make it any worse. That's my one of my main goals in life. When I talk to people who are dealing with stuff, it's just that that's my that's what I tell them. Don't make it any worse, you know. You know the only thing, uh, the only thing after River that I could tell you at that time was I don't know how to make. I don't know what to tell you what to do, but I I obviously showed you what doesn't work, you know, and that was yeah. that was the only thing I could tell you, and I'll never pretend to understand what that loss was like. But that was the only thing that I could say, you know. Yeah, I remember you, that. You saw. I don't know. What, I I never knew what to tell you, how to go forward or to do this. But you know, unfortunately, I uh, showed you. I remember. What I remember work. that conversation. What's crazy about your story? What the Flagstaff story, and people. Are, there's a lot of people that probably understand it. There's a lot more people that are probably thinking. Wow, that's that had to have been the worst thing that happened between those two, but it wasn't. No. Because something else happened later. Yeah. That ended up ending your drumming time with me. Mm -hmm. And it was technically worse than Flagstaff, and that ended our relationship, me being singer and you being drummer. Mm -hmm. It spun off into where you are now. I don't want to get into that now because I think we should do another podcast about that. And if you guys want to hear uh, how Caleb and I got to hear, comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Um, but believe it or not, we were temporarily healed in Colorado Springs after Flagstaff, and we did get better, and we played a lot more shows, and we traveled a lot more. Yeah. And then yeah, it got did. worse again in a different way. Yeah. And it ended up being the, the destruction of us on the stage. 
and the, then the introduction of Dusty Saxon, who's my current drummer. Who introduced me to you yes. in the first place. Yeah, Dusty introduced me to Caleb, and then Caleb replaced Dusty when things got worse again. And that's a whole different story, and a really good one, and a whole different podcast, and a whole different form of grief for you. And, and I want to also say that through all this, I've trusted you with me, me and my life, and I've trusted you with my family, because you and your wife now have been... Um, have spent much, a lot of time with my family, and I trust you uh, as as my own brother. And p- some people are probably go- just scratching their heads right now, going, "How did this? Y'all have the weirdest what? relationship." Yeah, I I don't, uh, I, I I don't. I think that's I think that is probably funny to some people. It's like, what does? Uh, there's no. There's no explain explaining. You know, because it, I, you don't get anything from me other than our, our friendship. Like I, I can't do a lot for you. No, you're a great warehouse manager. Well, you're yeah. really good at it. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have an affinity for corrugated paper. If you guys want to hear more from Caleb, comment below. Say we want more Caleb, and we'll do another podcast and explain that. Uh, there more. To this. There's not the rest of the story because there's more, and then there's more layers, and it's fascinating. But um, thank a, you, dude, for being on. I'm the onion of a man. Just I think you got layers. some management to do in the warehouse. So, Oh, am I working today? Yeah, yeah, you're working. All right, oh. see you guys. Love you. Yee, yee.